Well, welcome. Obviously, you've come on a very special day. We don't always have this. It's not a jacuzzi. This baptismal here. It's a, for a very special service. It's an important symbol. Sometimes ceremonies, some are more important than others, and this is a very important one. I still remember, as a young person, my baptism. I couldn't have been, I think, nine or ten. I was, I know it's hard for you to believe, but I was actually very thin back in those days. And I was led into chilly water. They hadn't invented heated water at that point. It was chilly water. In a baptismal built into a church, and I went down, and my feet came off the ground, and I started floating in there. And the strong arm of the pastor reached a hold of me and fished me up and brought me up. And to this day, I remember that, that splendid symbol of being lost, being no foundation, having no foundation, and God just grabbing a hold and raising you up. So we want to take a few moments and think about this symbol of baptism, what it means. And I'll be speaking primarily, primarily to the folks being baptized, but we can all listen in and we can all learn and maybe we can remember that moment in our lives. And maybe we can think about where we are in our journey and maybe it's time. So to do that, I want to look at the first Christian baptism, if you will, the original baptism. It's the baptism of Jesus. And we're going to look at the account as it's told in the Gospel of Matthew, Matthew chapter 3. And if you want to follow along in your pew Bibles there, you can look up to page 682 and the passage is there. And I'll just be making a few remarks on that story. It's a short story. It says, Then Jesus came from Galilee to the Jordan to be baptized by John. But John tried to deter him saying, I need to be baptized by you, and do you come to me? Jesus replied, let it be so now. It is proper for us to do this, to fulfill all righteousness. Then John consented. There's a lot of imagery in there, a lot of symbols. It has to do with this washing that was taking place in baptism. See, John came from a tradition that believed that in order to enter into the presence of God, you must be clean. And so he was this prophet that was designated to say, God is coming. The Messiah is coming. We're about to be ushered into the presence of God, and so we must be clean. And as a symbol of that need to be clean, they were baptized. And so that day... As Jesus came near, John saw him for who he is, and he was hesitant to baptize this Jesus because John understood above all else, he is the one that has to be clean. The Messiah is the one that should make us clean. See, because he comes from a long Old Testament tradition that understands that the closer you come to God, the cleaner you must be. At the heart of Old Testament worship, first in the tabernacle, then in the temple, there was the courtyards, and the closer you got to the courtyards, the more clean you had to be. There was a big labor, big area for washing. As soon as you walked in the courtyard, as you got closer to the temple, you had to be clean. When you went in the temple, you had to be clean, and in the middle of the temple, there was this, in the back middle, there was this place that was called the most holy place, the holy of holies. That's where God chose to reveal himself in all his holiness. And the idea was to go into that place, you had to be entirely and completely clean. In fact, to get to that place, only one person was allowed to go, and only that person could go once a year, the high priest of Israel. And only he could go in there that once a year after he had made all kinds of cleansing for himself and for his family. See, if you walk into the presence of God with sin and corruption, you die because God is holy. So that day, when Jesus came and asked to be baptized, John understood all that, and 
He knew somebody had to make him clean if he was going to get to this presence, that he was going to the presence of God's Messiah, God's Son. But Jesus says something very important. He says, you must do this to fulfill all righteousness. See, Jesus is telling us something about what's about to occur. That he is going to make it possible for us to be truly clean so we can enter the presence of God. We follow Jesus in baptism. He is making it possible for his righteousness and his holiness to be given to us as a free gift. He's giving us an illustration and an example and a promise that if we follow him into these waters of baptism, it's an outward symbol of this inner reality that we now have the righteousness of Christ given to us. When Christ washes us, when he makes us whole, when he makes us clean, we can enter into the most holy place. God takes that barrier, that sin and guilt, those things that separate us from him, God says he will rip that barrier apart. We follow Christ and his righteousness and his cleanliness is applied to us. We are clean as newborn babes as a result of his work. That's what this symbol says. So as we go through baptism, we ought to be reminding ourselves that we are no longer defined by our failures. We are not defined by our past sins, by our mistakes, by our corruption, by the wrong decisions, by our failures, not at all. We are now defined by the righteousness of Christ. He decides we are clean. He has given us that free gift of his righteousness, not because we've earned it, but out of his love. This symbol of baptism tells us that God has cleansed us thoroughly and entirely so we can enter into the holy presence of God. God is no longer this distant God of anger and fear and wrath. He is now your heavenly Father who welcomes you into his presence. Go there freely. Because you're wrapped in the righteousness of Christ, cleansed by his life. Well, this symbol is not just a symbol of our past and this one and done cleansing. No, it's much more powerful than that. The Son of God is there revealed as the one who will redeem us and cleanse us and make us new. But there's also a revelation of power that's still available to us in the present Look at the next verse. As soon as Jesus was baptized, he went up out of the water. And at that moment, heaven was opened, and he saw the Spirit of God descending like a dove and alighting on him. So we have the Son of God here, and now the Spirit of God, another person of the Trinity, shows up at this blessed event. The Spirit of God has been revealing this work of God all the way through the Old Testament. The first time we see him is in the opening verses of Genesis where he's hovering above the deep. God speaks and the Spirit of God creates a new world, creates what you and I see. This God has always been in the business creating and making new. He shows up here at this baptism as a dove. And scholars debate what that dove means, and I have a theory about that. If you look back at the Old Testament, you see the dove appear at a very important place. It was at the end of the story of the flood, where waters buried the whole earth, and life was gone. But when God was done judging, (laughs) new life was about to begin. And you remember the story that Noah sends out the dove once, comes back empty-handed. He sends out the dove again, and this time there's a little sprig of olive branch, a sign that new life was to begin. And finally he sends out the dove, and the dove finds a new place because creation is starting again. I think in this symbol, we are being told something about the creative power of God. He's about to begin a new creation. 
He is going to build a new world, a new world of redeemed people finding their heavenly Father, a new beginning from out of the depths, a new beginning of life. See, that same Spirit of God who showed up that day, God promises to us. That same Spirit of God who creates with power everything we see is also that small, still voice that can change a heart. So what we do on the outside, this sign of outer cleansing, God's going to start doing on the inside through his Spirit. Little by little, as he applies his word to our hearts, something will begin to change. Our hearts will change, our minds will change, our thoughts will change, our feelings will change. See, in this symbol, God is promising new life, new beginning, by the power of that same Spirit who was given to us when we trust in Him. But it's not just a Spirit for our present. It's a Spirit for our future. Let me explain. Look at this last sign, verse 17. And a voice from heaven said, this is my son, whom I love. With him, I am well pleased. We heard, we've seen the son of God in this symbol. We've seen the spirit of God in this event. And now we see the father. The father speaking his voice. It's a very blessed comment. He's saying something for our benefit. That he's pleased with his son. And the word there is delighted. He's delighted. In Paul's letter to the Romans, he says that in Christ we have a new destiny. We're destined to be conformed to the image of Jesus. And then he says, so that Christ might be the firstborn among many brothers and sisters. See, Jesus again is leading us. He's saying he is the firstborn. You are his brother and his sister. Which means that the Father is looking at each one of you today and saying, you are my son. You are my daughter. I am delighting in you. Do you understand and do you hear that voice? The Heavenly Father in Jesus is saying, you are my son. You are my daughter. I am so delighted with you. That's the promise we have in Christ. He is not just this holy God who is above and beyond us. He is the God now who is with us as our heavenly Father who loves us so much that he sent his Son to take the punishment for our sin so that we might be redeemed as his children. So as we go through this service a baptism, on one hand, it is, yes, you testifying to all of us that you are following Christ, but I want you to hear this. It is also a sign of God's promise to you, this promise that you are not defined by your past, but by his present and his past and his power and his glory and his love. And he is giving you the spirit that it's not just today, but forever. Because someday, this body that is being washed today, this body, like the body of Christ himself, is destined for death. Huh. But that is not the end of our story. This time, this body that is now being cleansed will one day be raised in a new body. It's a promise of this glorious body that even death will not end. It will be a glorious body that will, you will dwell in for the rest of all eternity as you come alongside Father, Son, and Spirit, there dwelling with Him forever. Redeemed, made whole, made clear. All that promised here in this service. So as we baptize, remember, believe, trust. And so let us then be baptized. In the name of the Father, Son, in the Spirit. Let's pray. Father, we thank you for this blessed event. We thank you for these people that step forward. Now may you confirm your promises in us as we follow you and baptize. 
in baptism where you, you commanded us to go into all the world and teach, and baptize, and we're just following that mission because we want them to hear this truth, that they are being affirmed as children of God, as your sons and daughters. Use this to stir all of our souls to grow us closer to you, and we ask this in Christ's name.